Um, okay. So let us begin our final day uh, of the conference. And uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, Alexei Borodin, who will talk to us about bias to buy two periodic at stack diamond and an elliptic curve. Uh, Alexei, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anton, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I have been enjoying the conference. It has been very interesting to me. So the, um, the subject that I'm going to talk about will start off um, with probability. And maybe originally it's not going to be clear how it is related to <clears throat> the bulk of the talks um, in the conference, but um, it will get related um, soon enough. So just bear with me, look at the pictures if you don't care about the probability and the integrable part will, will appear um, at some point. So the um, what's the object that I'm talking about? Um, this is um, fairly simple to, to describe. I, I want to um, consider a particular domain drawn on the square lattice, which is pictured on, well, let's say, the top three. Um, of the images on, on this slide. Um, it, it's been christened um, Aztec diamond by Jim Prop, who, who invented it. And it's not clear why this is such a nice domain to consider, but um, it will be clear in a second. And so once I, I fix the, the domain, what I want to look at is um, the set of all possible ways to tile this domain by dominoes, which are just two unit squares uh, glued together. Um, there, there are finitely many ways to do it. And then uh, I'm interested in uh, putting the uniform measure on all of those and saying something about the random tiling that, um, that I get in this fashion. Um, people have been looking at this model for 30 years, and uh, many things I know. I'll, I'll list them um, on the next slide. But before I do that, let me do a little trick which helps to um, picture the tiling better. So um, one starts by uh, putting the checkerboard um, coloring on the Aztec diamond, which is uh, the middle picture in the top row. And then one sees that. Um, it's natural to distinguish between four types of dominoes, not two. So two types originally seen are the vertical and horizontal ones. And um, uh, once you put the checkerboard pattern, then you'll see that each of those splits into two with the black square occupying either one or the other square. Then these four types could be colored in four different ways, which is the, the right most picture in the top in the top row, um, you get a colored picture. Um, then uh, the next step, which is um, sometimes helpful, is to turn this picture from flat to um, three-dimensional. And there is a way to parameterize um, tilings of um, any domain in the square letters, domino tilings of any domain in the square letters by a function. Um, called the height function. It's not a, a, a trivial construction. I'm not explaining how, how to do it. I can if you if you ask me. Um, but I'll just show. The, so the uh, the image on the right uh, bottom is what. So this is um, this is what uh, the height function does. It turns um, the the flat picture into a plot of a function, and this is a one-to-one -one correspondence by a certain recipe. Um, then uh, the middle picture on the bottom shows a um, random sample of, um, I think it's 100 by 100, Aztec diamond, um, the random tiling of the Aztec diamond of size 100 by 100, and, and one sees that there are features emerging, there, there are corners that are all of the same color, and then um, there is a certain curve um, 
that separates the single colored region from the, the chaotic ones. And then if one plays the same trick with the height function, then uh, uh, this um, sample turns into a nice smooth surface, which is um, on the left bottom. Um, okay. So the, this, as I said, this model is one of the most well um, studied models in, um, in the subject. Essentially everything is, is known about it. And uh, moreover, most of the phenomena that, that people like to talk about can be observed on, on this model. This is sort of a, a perfect representative of um, various uh, phenomena. So what are some of the things um, that, that people know? Um, first of all, the, uh, the question of how many tilings there are of this domain has a pretty answer, which is a power of two. It's two raised to binomial coefficient. And um, you know, if you think of other domains that come to mind, like square um, or something similar, similarly simple, then you never get such a simple answer. This is one indication that this is a very nice domain to look at. There is a, a, a very nice sampling algorithm known as domino shuffling that allows one to produce um, a uniformly random sample by a sequence of uh, simple coin flips. And this is what um, produces the pictures that I'm going to, to show throughout the talk. Um, the frozen boundary, so the curve that separates the, um, the monochrome regions from uh, the chaotic ones is a circle. Um, it's called um, an Arctic circle quite appropriately it separates the frozen part from the unfrozen one. And then uh, um, at the next level, at the level of fluctuations, one can study the fluctuations if one goes into the chaotic region and stays on the lattice scales. Then if you go in, into um, the region and you observe something on the lattice that is translation invariant, this is known as the translation theory and Gibbs measures. There is a two parameter family of those um, and people know how to describe them. Then uh, uh, the fluctuations of the frozen edge, so the Arctic circle are describable in an efficient way. Um, they're given by something called the area two process, the object that originated in, in random matrix theory. And then one can also look at the fluctuations of the random surface around the, the limit shape, and that produces a conformal invariant object called, called the two-dimensional Gaussian free field. So um, lots of papers go in, into, into this um, one-page description. Um, most of the phenomena that I listed here are, are universal. Well, not the shuffling and the number of tilings, but the fluctuations phenomena, and they, they are um, met throughout the world of, of similarly defined statistical physics systems. Now, so um, once I said that um, everything is, is known about this um, model, what am I going to talk about? So I'm going to talk about the following uh, modification of the model. I'm still looking at the same domain. So this is the Aztec diamond. Um, um, but the measure on tilings that I'm going to look at is not going to be uniform anymore. And the weight for a tiling will be uh, defined as the product of um, weights of um, edges of the square lattice that are occupied by dominoes. So um, and the picture on the left, um, you see drawn on top of the domino tiling, the dual graph generated by um, the midpoints of the square cells of the lattice, and then dominoes form edges of that lattice. And so what, what one does is one multiplies weights um, corresponding to all the occupied edges. So if the weights are all one, then one is back to the uniform measure. Now, if the weights are not all one, um, then it's something else. And so, Let's look at two examples of the assignments of weights. 
So one example is in the middle. On top, the, there's a weight assignment. And on the bottom, there is a sample. Um, so the weight assignment uh, has a periodic structure in uh, both horizontal and vertical direction. Um, the period is two. There is one parameter that, that governs the, um, the object, and that parameter is alpha. And um, below, you see, there is a sample. And um, on the sample, um, what you can see is uh, that there is some new phenomenon that shows up in the middle of the square. Um, there is a, a new phase um, that appears that's characterized by different type of local fluctuations. The fluctuations there decay exponentially with distance. Uh, the correlations of the fluctuations decay exponentially um, in distance, um, as opposed to the chaotic region, ring-like region around where they decay as um, one over the distance. So um, the picture on the right is a slight modification of um, the picture in the middle. And the modification is that one introduces a bias. One puts an additional weight on all um, vertical lozenges versus the horizontal, uh, sorry, all vertical dominoes versus <clears throat> the horizontal ones. So all vertical dominoes <coughs> get um, an additional constant um, A. And that leads to the squishing of the limiting shape. Um, and it seems that everything looks very similar. Um, and to, to a point, it does. So what, what does look similar? So first of all, both, both pictures exhibit this new face. And if one goes into the three-dimensional representation of the picture, then uh, um, this, this new face will uh, show itself as a region, a facet. Um, there is still the shuffling algorithm that allows one to produce pictures um, for both cases. And then uh, there is a, a very nice work um, going back 20 years ago by Kenya, Nakwinkoff and, and Sheffield that describes what kind of local limits one could expect from um, tilings of domains with this particular type of weights on the, on the edges. Now, on the other hand, um, the model on the left um, basically has been solved. So the, since um, about 10 years ago, starting with the work of, of Chita and, and Jan, people learned how to figure things out. So for example, how to find the uh, limit shape. Um, you know, this curve that separates the frozen from unfrozen, then another curve that separates um, the central region from the, uh, um, the surroundings. It's actually two pieces of the same curve. Um, and um, local fluctuation, you know, people learn how, how to do things. On the other hand, um, um, the model on the right with the extra bias um, so far remained um, unsolved. So the, the even the, the equations of these separating curves were unknown and um, and that is related to um, a very concrete fact that I hope to, to explain um, a little bit later um, why one is simpler than the other um, and what one needs to do in order to handle the the more complicated biased case so uh, before I get to um, to that explanation I need to make um, a a transformation on the on the domino tilings, which is standard and allows one to put the model into the uh, um, random matrix C language. So the transformation is from the domino tilings to non-intersecting paths um, that are drawn on a directed graph on the plane. So um, the picture on the top left uh, shows the transformation uh, pictorially. Um, I don't quite want to go through the details of what's going on. They're well documented and they have been used um, in dozens of papers. Um, but um, I, I just want to communicate the message, which is that one starts with um, 
a tiling of the Aztec diamond. And then uh, by a certain algorithmic recipe, one produces um, a sequence of non-intersecting paths on the left. And so this is uh, here. Um, and these paths all start with the packed configuration um, on one boundary. They finish at another packed configuration on the, on the other boundary. And uh, the graph on which these uh, paths are drawn consists of um, vertical layers. And each of those vertical layers is very simple. So they alternate between even and odd. And uh, um, odd layers um, have the form of an edge that goes to the right or by one unit up. And then the even layers have a slightly different form. You can see on the picture. So this is a this is a, a magnified version of the section of the graph. Um, so if one wants to consider the uniform measure on dominant islands, then um, all weights uh, of the graph should have weight one uh, should be one. And if one wants to consider the doubly periodic um, weighting. Um, that's actually pictured over here. Um, and then one needs to assign weights to these edges on the graph. And, and I've, I've written those weights on the edges. Now, the, the next step that uh, should get us closer to the, the integrable structure is to actually parameterize these transitions between um, different vertical sections um, of my graph by um, matrices. So the, these are these are matrices that uh, these are two by two matrices that depend on um, on a formal variable, so far formal ver variable Z. And they encode the, the weights in the following way. So they are two by two because um, we have um, the periodicity of order two. And so if we look, for example, at this matrix at A odd, and then we forget about the term uh, that contains Z, then we have three terms, uh, three matrix elements, and those three matrix elements encode the transitions within the block. So we have alpha going across, we have um, um, one over alpha going across. These are two diagonal elements. We also have A over alpha shifting by one. And then there is one transition that moves us from one two by two block to the other. And so that movement from one block to the other acquires a power of Z. Now this is a standard way to, to encode um, block toplets matrices by um, their symbols, but also it's very, well, it's possible to see pictorially what's going on. And in the similar way, the transitions on the even steps um, are encoded by another two by two matrix um, dependent on Z. Um, one can see that there is here um, a denominator. So this thing should really be thought of as the sum of um, A to the power 2M over Z to the M. M is greater or equal than um, um, zero. And that corresponds to the fact that one can move down uh, many steps on uh, the even transitions. And um, you know, that, that acquires weights of A and, and that's um, how we get it. So um, the non-trivial statement is that doing these manipulations, passing from Aztec diamond to um, these um, two by two matrices dependent on Z, um, that these manipulations actually help in describing uh, what's going on with the Aztec diamond, um, that's a non-trivial statement. And so what the next slide will show is that one, what, what one needs to do is one needs to, the key step, the non-trivial part in, in, in the process is that one needs to take uh, these two matrices, multi corresponding to the movement um, on the odd step and even step, and then raise it to a large power. So that corresponds to moving all the way across this long picture. And that's going to be a Z dependent two by two matrix. And so what one wants to do is one wants to, to perform um, a wiener hope factorization of this matrix, meaning that um, the part of the matrix that's um, 
dependent on one over z wants to be separated from the part that depends on z. So I want to split it into a product of two, one of which is holomorphic inside the unit circle together with its inverse, and the other one is holomorphic on the other on the outside. So that's really the, the heart of what needs to be done in order to get a hold of um, um, the probabilistic questions. Um, this is the actual statement of um, a non-trivial and, and, and rather powerful, I, I believe, statement that allows one to produce correlations for the outstack diamond um, if one knows the winner hope factorization. And uh, I'm tempted not to go through this formula in detail. This, is, um, this must look uh, fairly complicated to, to people who have never, who, who has never who have never had experience with, with these formulas. It's um, actually pretty nice in the sense that um, it allows for asymptotic analysis um, and um, many examples of, of, of such analysis um, has been done. Um, I only emphasize that somewhere inside this formula over here in, in, in red, there is this wiener hope factorization of um, the, the matrix, which is, um, well, which is the matrix from my previous slide. So one takes the product of these two two by two matrices, then raises to a large power. This is the matrix A of Z over here. And then one wants to split it into the product of um, holomorphic inside and outside of the unit circle. And when, when once one knows that, one puts it into um, this contour integral, and that is a workable expression for extracting um, answers to asymptotic questions. Um, so let me keep this um, at, at, at that level, and let me get to the question of how one, one actually does this wiener hope factorization. So maybe maybe I'll say one more word. Why wiener hope factorization? So um, Usually when one deals with tiling problems um, and one wants to compute um, correlations for, for dimers or for dominoes, then there is a, a problem of inverting a matrix um, that is lurking somewhere. So the very first uh, works by, by Kesteline about that made a very important um, conclusion that if one starts with what's now called cast Castelline matrix of, of the graph, which is essentially the incidence matrix decorated with signs, and then computes the inverse of that matrix, then that, that inverse Castelline matrix produces the, the, the correlations in some rather explicit way. It's all good, except for it's very hard to invert a huge matrix. You know, imagine that stack diamond, imagine, imagine a matrix with a, um, rows and columns marked by vertices of um, that, that um, piece of the square lattice, and then uh, inverting that matrix is difficult. So people come, come with ways of simplifying this um, type of um, questions. And so um, my procedure with non-intersecting paths is essentially a way of simplifying this procedure down to inverting another matrix. So that other matrix that shows up has a structure, it's actually a block toplets matrix of a large size. So block toplets matrices or toplets matrices in general, so those are matrices with, so toplets matrices are the matrices with the matrix elements that are, that are constant along the diagonals. So those matrices, um, if you take a, um, a large but finite piece of such a matrix, you want to find its inverse. There is a fundamental result due to Harold Widom that says that if you want to, invert such a matrix approximately, what you need to do is you need to look at its symbol, which is a generating function of the matrix of the matrix entry sitting in the diagonals. And then you need to do the winner hope factorization of the symbol, which corresponds to splitting the matrix basically in the upper and lower triangular part um, approximately. And then once you manage to do that, then the inversion, approximate inversion, is fine. You invert, you invert each of the parts and then you multiply them together. 
And the same thing works in the block templates case, which is the one I'm in right now. Um, and that's the reason why the win and hope factorization shows up, shows up here. Now that's not historically how it appeared. Historically, it appeared um, through matrix value of orthogonal polynomials um, in the work of um, Deutz Kuhlers and then um, Herbert Deutz. And that's related to the, the, the talk by Marco Bertola um, earlier in the conference, but I'll, I'll leave that part um, aside. So um, by now, um, if you want, um, you could uh, forget about um, probability or um, contour integrals or whatever um, I spoke about. And so the problem at hand is that um, one takes uh, two two by two matrices that are written on the slide, multiplies them together, raises that product to a large power, and then one wants to, to separate Z and one over Z. How to do that? So um, here is one way of doing that. It's not the only way, but it's a, at least it's something to start with. So if one just has power one, so if one just has two matrices, so here are my two matrices on top, one dependent on Z, the other one dependent on one over Z. And so if one takes them, um, and if I want to, um, find the, the winner hop factorization of that. So I want to basically move one over Z to the left and, and Z to the right. Then well, these are two by two matrices. This can be done explicitly. And you see that there was a one over Z over here and it moved to one over Z over there. And the Z here moved to Z over there. And then there is some coefficient recalculation happening. And that's, um, that's explicit. Um, and the problem is that um, if one wants to do it to a power, then um, this kind of manipulation needs to be done many, many times. So here is, uh, um, in red here, I guess, this is what's going on. So one starts with a power, and then um, what one does is that one takes uh, pairs um, within that power and then uh, flips them in the way that the top line shows. And then uh, this gives another product. And then one, one takes that product and takes other set of pairs inside and then flips them again. And then uh, proceeding in the same way, one eventually can flip all the, all, the, all the pairs up to the middle and then separate the, the minus part that contains uh, um, uh, one over Z and, and the plus part that contains the Z. So in effect, one needs to take this top line and, and one needs to repeat this um, factorization many times. So what, what is um, exactly um, the flow? The flow is that one starts with two, two by two matrices, then one refactorize them, refactorize them in such a way that um, the eigenvalues or the zeros of the, uh, um, of the determinant split um, positions. And then one takes two factors and moves them by force, just takes them, permutes them, and then refactorizes them again, permutes them, refactorizes and so on. And then one does that many times. So this um, operation is um, well known and uh, is um, a, an object of the theory of um, integrable systems. Um, so here is this operation um, on the top line in, um, in, in explicit form. One starts with a two by two matrix with the Z in, um, in one corner and Z inverse um, in the other corner. Then uh, one starts with this matrix represented as a product in, in one direction and then one changes the direction, splits the, the, the eigenvalues. So um, the key idea of um, how one does it, and that um, goes in, in a very explicit form to the paper of um, uh, Moser and Veselov that's quoted on, on the next slide. Um, but 
that really should be thought of as a general idea for integrable systems is that uh, one, one needs to find the lax pair for this in evolution. So the lax pair in this case just means that one, one has to look at the eigenvectors of the matrix. So the, um, the eigenvectors that I denote by, by C over here, well, first of all, the manipulation of permuting the two factors doesn't change the spectrum, um, which means that um, the determinant of uh, this object, the char characteristic polynomial stays fixed. The equality uh, of it to zero produces something known as the spectral curve. And then uh, um, at each step, um, the eigenvector gets multiplied by um, a piece of our matrix P of Z, which has a prescribed spectrum. That's the type of the flow we are looking at. So these two equations form um, the black pair. One doesn't need to use the terminology here in principle, but one could. Um, for similarity, I, I put in green, um, Lax pair for the KDV equation, and so the um, the eigenvector C plays the role of the um, of the Baker here as a function for for the KDV, pretty much. Okay, so um, so what is going to happen? What is the the uh, the geometric picture of what's going to happen? What's the benefit of going to um, the eigenvector? Well, the the benefit is the following. So if one um, considers um, the, um, the curve defined by the equation determinant of my matrix minus um, a variable equals to zero. So that curve that the characteristic polynomial, it doesn't change under the, under the flow. Um, as I said, this is typically called the spectral curve. In this case, everything is very explicit. It's, it's an elliptic curve. It's a curve of genus one. And then if one looks at um, the eigenvalue, so the eigenvalue, sorry, not the eigenvalue, the eigenvector C. So if the determinant of this matrix is zero, then it must have a null vector generically. So if one looks at that null vector, so that null vector is uh, um, a function on um, the spectral curve for each point of the spectral curve, generically have a null vector. One might want to normalize it to, to, to make things concrete. Um, this is sometimes referred to as the Brovin's normalization, but um, one can use other ones as well. So then if one normalizes it in this way, then what will happen is that the flow, when, when viewed as, as the flow of eigenvectors, um, will um, do the following thing. The, um, the coordinates of my eigenvector will both be meromorphic functions on the spectral curve. They will have um, two simple poles that are not going to move. Now, uh, any meromorphic function on the elliptic curve should have as many poles as there are zeros, and so there should be two zeros. And then uh, for each of the two coordinates, one of the zero, one of the zeros is going to be known for one of the matrix elements is going to be at zero, the other one is going to be at infinity. And then uh, the second zero for each coordinate is uh, free to move. And so under the flow, that zero will undergo a linear evolution. So that, that zero will be shifted at every step by a fixed vector of, um, of, the, of the torus in the, in the toric um, representation of the elliptic curve. So this is um, um, the scheme very much described in uh, this paper in, in several examples. Now, um, the idea of the, um, of the linear flow on uh, the, um, um, on the zeros of the Baker here as a function, of course, goes back to um, the final gap method um, and that's what Moser and Veselov were um, following in the discrete time situation. And um, the um, vector value Baker Hezier functions were first, to the best of my knowledge, considered by the Brovinitz and Kritschever um, in, the, in the mid 70s. 
Okay, so um, this is sort of this was sort of an abstract picture, and um, a much more concrete um, realization of what I just said with formulas is presented on um, this and and the next slide. Um, I'm not sure to what extent I should uh, um, bore this audience with the computations, but um, I'll I'll go through them maybe for the sake of couple of people who, who have not seen um, this thing before. So everything is very concrete. And in fact, I think that this example could compete for the simplest uh, example of applying um, Moser web vessel of techniques um, or finite gap method in discrete time in general. So one, one, one starts with a two by two matrix with a fixed spectrum. So here I, I fixed the uh, um, the trace and, and the determinant of the matrix. Um, it's the same as fixing the spectrum. So then the spectral curve um, here. So I slightly changed the, the characteristic polynomial in order for the spectral curve to be an elliptic curve in the standard representation with, um, with W square separated. So this is my elliptic curve. Now, um, if one looks for, um, for example, the zeros of the first coordinate of the eigenvector. So what that means is that we are looking for the situation when zero one is an eigenvector. So if we impose that this is an eigenvector of, of, um, of my matrix, then um, it's elementary to show that there is a unique point of the elliptic curve where this is realized. And moreover, this correspondence between the matrices and um, the points on the elliptic curve is one to one. So there is a parameterization of these matrices up to, up to diagonal conjugation by the points of the elliptic curve. So the, the moduli space, if one, if one wants, here is just an elliptic curve. Um, all right. And then uh, once I have parameter the parameterization of my matrix by points of the elliptic curve, I can now um, I can look at the evolution of the zero of the first coordinate of um, the eigenvector. Um, how do I do that? Well, if I, if I have a parameterization of my matrix, I can find its explicit split into the positive and negative part, the holomorphic inside, holomorphic outside part. Then I need to multiply my null vector by one of these parts. And what I'm going to see is that the, the um, the coordinate of the uh, the first coordinate of the new null vector is going to be a linear function in Z and W, and for that linear function, one can find um, two zeros on the elliptic curve easily just from definition of uh, coordinateization, um, and then uh, the third zero will actually determine the new position of the uh, of the vanishing point, the point that we are tracking, the zero of the L zero of the, well, the point at which zero one is an eigenvector, and this so this this def, this just produces the, the definition of the addition on the elliptic curve. There is a line, which is um, well this this thing over here. We know two points on that line, we're interested in a third one, and that's literally the addition on the elliptic curve. So the, the fact that uh, uh, the evolution of the zero is a shift, um, one can see that from the abstract framework, and one can also see that from just doing an explicit computation. here. So um, one could uh, um, rejoice at this point that the problem is, is solved. The, uh, the only problem is that this information that, that one gets, the um, linearization of the flow and the expression of the flow in terms of um, theta functions, that needs to be reinserted into the description of um, the correlation on the Aztec diamond. And, and if you remember the factorization of the matrix that I had there, there was this power um, raised to the power n, and then in the end, 
it got split into two pieces, each of which had many factors. So I know by now that each of the factors is expressible in terms of my flow on the elliptic curve. So there is a formula involving theta functions if one wishes to go that way. What I need to do is I need to insert that. So, you know, these P zero minus P one minus and so on, they are evaluations of some expression on points of the orbit on the elliptic curve or the orbit of the addition on the elliptic curve. So I need to put that in. I need to put that into the two, two fold contour integral that I had originally. And um, then I need to do the analysis. So uh, that's, a bit more than just linearizing the flow. And uh, so far um, we've been able to, to handle this case, um, um, sort of just one case actually, well, not one, but uh, one subcase, which is when um, the flow on the elliptic curve is um, um, a finite order. So the, the, the point is a torsion point. And um, after finitely many steps, we return back to, to the same, um, location. Now, why, why is that simpler? Well, if we imagine that uh, these P0, P1, and so on. Alyosha, uh, may I interrupt you? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I miss some point. What's the, how you choose the flow? Because there are many flows, they are parameterized by Z1 and Z2, you mentioned, to zeros or two points on the elliptic curve. Are they fixed from the beginning or or so, 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 right in, in, in this case the the flow is easy to fix in the sense that the matrix that I start with only has two eigenvalues. So the, the there are two values at which the determinant of this matrix vanishes. And so I forgot what they are. I don't know. Um, Z1 oh, and oh, Z2. Okay, okay, now I see. One of them is inside the unit circle, the other one is outside, and you just want to swap them. So in this particular case, there is no question of, as I said, this is probably the simplest example in, in which the, the general theory is meaningfully applicable. Um, there is an additional question actually of, uh, of how, it, of how one fixes the factorization because the factorization into two pieces is not generally speaking prescribed in a unique way. And one needs to define the gauge by proper conjugation by diagonal matrices, but that, that can be done in a good way. So, um, this is not one of the examples considered by Moser Resilov. They, they, they have more complicated um, situations um, as far as I can see. Yeah, it's harder to find something simpler than that. Anyway, so, so I was at the point of saying that um, if my flow is periodic, then I have a simplification. And so the simplification is really that this long product of, of a points of an orbit, it splits into pieces of finite length and each of that piece is the same. So I eventually just get the power of some matrix and that matrix is a product over the finite orbit. Powers of matrices are nice in this. Then um, um, compute the asymptotics um, that way, you know, finding the, uh, the eigenvalues and everything is determined by the eigenvalues. And so this is, this is what we've done. Um, let me backtrack a little bit. So um, now that everything is uh, in terms of this flow and the elliptic curve, if um, I degenerate back to the case of the uniform um, domino tiling, so that's um, the weights are all equal to one. So this is when the elliptic curve degenerates to um, the curve of geno zero. And um, uh, in fact, what happens is that the compact oval of, of the elliptic curve degenerates to a point and so the flow that we are looking at degenerates to just that point being always there. So one starts with that point and never moves. So there is no flow. And that's the uniform case. Everything is simple and, and, and so on. Um, now the case um, of A equal to one. So 
Um, I don't know if I so the case A equals one is this case over here. This is the case that has been uh, solved by reasonably ad hoc computations before. Um, so that case actually corresponds to um, this the the unique situation when um, the orbit has size four. So um, this is the orbit literally over here. And even though it has size four, you can actually see that um, in, in, in two steps, you get expressions. And so people realized that they were looking at, at the matrices and just by manipulating the matrices, they could see that nice patterns evolve. Um, uh, nice patterns arise when they do this couple of refactorizations. And so that's how that, that, that case was handled. Um, this is um, the next simplest situation sort of after the, the no flow at all. So the next simplest one is actually the point of period six. Um, and that's uh, the relation between two parameters, um, A and alpha that I have in my lattice that gives rise to this period um, six situation. And then we don't actually have the, um, a good understanding of, um, of where these um, um, finite torsion points come from. This is related, I think, to the question raised by, uh, by Vladimir Fock when he said that he, uh, that um, the question of um, involutions is not, is not quite clear in the situation that he was talking about in the, in the Fock, um, sorry, in the adventure of Kenyan um, dynamics. Um, but in any case, for each point, of finite, of, of finite order, we are able to do the analysis. So just as an, um, I'm not gonna say much about the analysis. Um, it's a steepest descent argument on contour integrals. And um, the slide that, that, that I posed, that, that I put out here is just to demonstrate what happens to the contours. I, I enjoyed the manipulation. So the usual manipulation of contours um, in steepest descent analysis happens in the complex plane. In this case, the, the steepest descent analysis needs to happen on the Riemann surface. In our case, that we consider here is just a two sheeted Riemann surface. It's an elliptic curve. Um, so one actually takes the contours on those uh, two sheets and then moves them around. Um, everything is happening on the elliptic curve, so you can move them through, through cuts and all, and you want to position them in such a way that um, the integrand mostly decays, except for maybe one point. And that's the way the argument goes. Um, that, let me just stop that argument here, not, not go through the details. There are possibilities that are pictured on, on the right side. And I found it enjoyable to, to play with these things. So this is a, um, uh, this, is an, this is a formula for um, the, the frozen, for the frozen curve. So this is uh, uh, the curve that separates the frozen region from the not so frozen one. And actually it's the same curve that separates the central star-like region uh, with different asymptotic behavior from uh, the ring around it. It happens to be, um, in the case, in the finite order case that so far we considered happens to be a degree eight curve. Um, this is uh, its equation in the, in the period six case. It's not such an appetizing equation to look at. So maybe this is not the, the greatest object to, um, to consider, but this is the curve one sees when one does the simulations. And um, there is an equation for what it's worth. So, um, that's about it. Um, I wanted to maybe draw a couple of connections. Um, so Vladimir Fox spoke about um, Kenyan venture of um, um, integrable system, um, which um, um, actually has a lot to do with what's going on here. Um, the difference now, the major difference be between uh, uh, the work of Venture of Kenyon and previous work of, um, of Kenyon Akunkov uh, about the topic is that um, they considered um, tilings or dimers on tori. So, um, and that's where 
the theory of the spectral curve and the um, plus the divisor, the so-called spectral transform um, introduced first by, by Kenyon and Kunkov. And then um, the modifications of um, that spectral um, data by adding divisors of degree zero at infinity of the spectral curve. That's the, uh, the Gancherov Kenyon integrable system. So that all applied to, um, to Tori. Um, so Tori is an important case for DIMA models, but they only describe um, what happens in translation invariant situations. So in a way, uh, they just predict what happens in the bulk of uh, pictures like this. Um, what one wants to do for a complete understanding or for some sort of a more complete understanding is to consider the domains which are not translation invariant, not tori, not flat like the square, for example, but something like the Aztec diamond, which is probably one of the simplest example. And so if one goes to the Aztec diamond, then um, it's not obvious how to apply the, the theory from the torus to that Aztec diamond. There is in principle a variational problem that's supposed to describe the, the limit shape and um, the functional and the variational problem, the, the, the surface tension comes from um, the torus problem. Um, however, solving that variational problem is hard. And in this particular setup, nobody knows, no, nobody knows how to do that. Um, so the fact that the um, integrable system of Venturona Canyon shows up in this setup, it wasn't obvious to me. Um, maybe somebody could explain to me that I should have expected that. And the fact that it can actually be used in order to describe the asymptotic phenomena in the non-translation variant situation was a novelty to me. So this is ultimately what um, the work um, intended to do. The, the, the linear flow on the elliptic curve itself is um, not quite a triviality, but a, a well understood um, phenomenon arising from matrix factorizations or from adding divisors um, on the Jacobian, that, that's all fine. But the fact that that could be put into the framework of non-translation there in diamond models and um, employed to get answers to asymptotic questions, that seems to be, um, that seems to be a, a new piece. And um, we don't understand yet how far that piece will go. What classes of domains will be um, susceptible to this kind of approach, but um, people are working. So maybe something will, um, something nice will, will come up. And then also I, I spoke about the period two situation. So the weights are periodic in, 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 uh, in both horizontal and vertical directions with period two. Of course, an obvious generalization is to consider higher order periodicity. That leads to higher genus curves and uh, linearization on, on the Jacobian. Um, putting that to work asymptotically is more of a challenge and um, we are trying, but uh, so far, um, the only paper that has been written is on two by two situation and the elliptic curve. And that's the one that I tried to, to show in the talk. So at this point, I'll, I'll conclude. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Are there any questions for the Alexei? For Alexei? Mm, Alors, uh, how you describe this boundary of the semi-frozen, or I forget how you call it. Is it the, okay, you wrote the equation, which looks pretty ugly, yeah. but is there some description of this curve? Is it an image under certain, say, amoeba map of some cycle on the elliptic curve? What is it? Yeah, so, so the, um, the, the way that, um, Yes, it's a, it's an
it is an image under a certain map of the um, of the amoeba. That that's um, that's a correct um, statement. Um, the map, so in particular, um, in the higher genus situation, uh, the number of um, um, you know stars that one will have here. Um, will correspond to the genus of the curve. And, and, and one could think of these stars as uh, being images in some way of the compact ovals of, um, um, of the corresponding curve of, this, of the spectral curve. Um, the, the map itself is um, not so trivial to describe as you can see from the, from the equation. It's, <clears throat> from the equation itself, it um, it basically comes from a certain um, function, um, sort of action functional that's defined on the spectral curve. Um, that functional has um, zeros. And so the, the case of the double zero corresponds to the point on the boundary, or, you know, both boundaries actually, this one and, and, and this one. And so when one actually goes through that functional and then works it out, then this is, this, this is what comes up. So it's some sort of a map determined by the problem and the, the, the domain and you know, so on from the spectral curve. So the answer to a question is yes, but, but that, that map contains the data from the concrete model we are looking at. So you mentioned this is a double points of the curve. So the curve you are, you are getting is singular. Am I correct? No, no. The, the, the curve is uh, smooth. It's the, the function on the curve that we have, um, the, the action functional on the curve whose zeros determine oh, I see. The, uh, um, the locations of these things. They could be degenerate. Yes. There is an additional data. So in addition to the spectral curve, there is a, a function um, that's related to the specificity of the domain. And the behavior of that, of the zeros of that function lead to the behavior of the probabilistic model. Thank you. Yeah. Peter, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I've got a question. A uh, very nice talk, by the way, Alexei, and good to see you. Um, Thank you. I, yeah, I, 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 um, I enjoyed it a lot. So I, I, my question is, um, there must be something that goes wrong with using the nonlinear steepest descent method on the original large N Wiener-Hopf problem, two by two matrix Wiener-Hopf problem, right? Is, or, or is that... Um, so that, that approach is um, being developed to a certain extent by, by Arno, by Arno Quillars and, and his students. And um, there is some distance that one can go with that. So uh, in particular, the, um, you know, the, the case of period four is um, the one that has been handled by that method, basically. I mean, they started with the Riemann Hilbert and, and, and they worked through the usual Riemann Hilbert. Now, um, I'm afraid I'll, I'll, I'll mislead you if I tell you what goes wrong there because I haven't tried. I, I'm, I think that maybe the G function is not so, so easy to find. Um, you know, the... Um, the solution of the variational problem that goes into the transformation of the Riemann Hilbert to the form you want is not so easy to find. And the last I've heard is that Arno and, and maybe one of his students um, found a way to employ theta functions in order to get there. But okay, the, la the latest I've heard was uh, a talk by Arno three weeks ago at, at, at course conference where he said that while well, they're working for the hexagon case, so they're looking at the hexagon with some high periodicity, uh, laws and stylings, and, and they're trying to make it work, but you know, so far it hasn't worked, so there was some progress in that direction. So um, okay. he'd be better suited to answer that question. Um, luckily, in this case, that's sort of reminiscent of, so th this case is not really requiring Riemann Hilbert in the, in the non-periodic situation, right? This is the case when you can just 
do everything with quantum integrals. This is Kravchuk polynomials type situation. Right, right. And, and, and so it seems that in, in situations of this type, one doesn't need to, one can, but doesn't need to employ the full power of Riemann Hilbert. One can get rid with the class, you know, sort of the, the classical integrable system approach. I see. But for something like the hexagon, of course, that's what I'm talking about is not going to work. And so more powerful Riemann Hilbert should come in. But, um, and the two should get reconciled, right? At least in this case, the two should get reconciled, but that hasn't happened yet. So there are these sort of mm -hmm. two, two directions that will eventually merge, I believe. In Great. Simplest Thank you. Very, yeah, um, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, can, uh, hi, can, can I ask a question? So, uh, so the, uh, the, the, uh, okay. So the spectral curve that you are looking at seems to be just uh, the uh, one period the uh, total lattice. So, um, is, is there exists uh, like uh, probability models that model like a uh, hygienous total lattice? So I don't know what probabilistic quantity in the mm -hmm. model I'm looking at will be a tau function of the total lattice. Um, this would be the first question to me. What is exactly the probabilistic observable that should lead to the total lattice? The one that I'm talking about is not literally tau functions of total, at least I, I don't know of that fact. Uh, I, I mean, there, there's spectral curve that you, uh, there are two by two metrics uh, specifically. I think that's, yes. uh, uh, yeah, it's a list that's very close to the genus one case of Toda, periodic I, Toda. I, I, yeah. I agree that the, the, the two by two matrices and the elliptic mm -hmm. curve, that, that's fine. But then if you mm -hmm. want to get uh, um, a solution to, to, to the Toda, then you want to consider the ratio of, of the log of the ratio of two theta functions or something like uh -huh. that. Uh -huh. So what does that object have to do with my original probabilistic model? Mm -hmm. I don't have okay. an answer to that. I'm not saying that that answer is not there. I just don't know it on top of my head. So I think if we understand uh, how the tau function of total or the log of the ratio of two theta functions shows up probabilistically, then we'll have an answer of how higher genus total will show up in, 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 in higher periodicity examples. But to me, the first thing would be to understand why Toda is natural to the problem I'm looking at right now, because I don't know that answer. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Alexey, I have a question I may be way off, but is there any connection between this and this uh, discrete isomonodromy, discrete Pandeva type of questions? Because the way matrices are parameterized, this ansatzes and also the whole refactorization um, dynamics is very familiar. So I, I, I agree with you. That's <clears throat> that's how I, I I first knew I could put some some depth into this problem. I mean, so so the um, um, where is my dynamic? So um, so for the the case of of Penleve of the isomonodromy deformation is different by the fact that over here you would have um, the shift of the argument. So right. you know, instead of this, you would have that. So um, if we go to the uh, um, to the undeformed problem, you know, the very first I started with. Then if you want uh, to see Penleve in this problem, discrete Penleve, what you need to look at is you need to look at the distribution of um, the um, boundary point of the frozen region. So if you take a vertical section and you look at the position where the blue dimers stop and something else appears, so that position its distribution is a tau function of the discrete Penleve. Okay. 
And the argument goes through some of the same machinery that I talked about um, with the extra shift coming from the, the fact that this cutoff is variable. So it's natural to ask if I take the periodic situation and I look at a similar cutoff over here, what kind of Penleve or Penleve object, Penleve equation it would satisfy? I, I don't know an answer to that. This is a natural question. I, I believe it's going to be a tau function of, of a discrete isomonary deformation of something, of some discrete connection on P1. What, what exactly this is going to be, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the model that I, well, I mean, the, the solution that I talked about right now does not involve this extra complication. I don't have this uh, um, you know, varying cutoff point. And that's why my integrable system is completely integrable. It, it's, not, it's not the isomonodromic type. Mm -hmm. So it's like autonomous. Yeah. It's autonomous, that's correct. The Hamiltonians are autonomous. Yeah, this is, this is a complete, mm -hmm. classically completely integrable system, you know, linearized by linear flow on the torus. So. Mm -hmm. so then maybe it's some kind of QRT type dynamics or something like that, but we're running out of time. So I probably should uh, stop with this question here and let's take a very brief four minute break and uh, then move on to the next talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.